Well, you see God's love in everything, don't you? That's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about God and love. And um, this is going to be an abridged sermon because we want to open it up to everyone else to be able to speak at this one also. So before we begin, let's have a word of prayer. Loving Father in heaven, Lord, as we go over this, this topic, Lord, that is the very core of who you are, the very core of our salvation, it's all done through love. Lord, please be with us here today. Open our minds, recall to us the different times, moments, tribulations, and trials that we've been through that you've seen us through and that we can put our faith and confidence in you. Lord, please um, touch my lips with a coal from the altar, Lord, that, that I may represent you here um, and that only you would be exalted. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So I want to start by reading um, from Steps to Christ, which, by the way, this little book, such an amazing book. You know, you give this to somebody, and they might not know a thing about Christianity. But this is going to explain to them the sin problem, the atonement to a certain extent, and how, step by step, how to get right with God. And what's most important, that almost as so sewn together like a garment, every little strand has, has that, that ingredient of love in there. It's such a beautiful book, and it, I'm going to quote from it twice today. But the first quote comes from page 63 of Steps to Christ, page 63. When we speak of faith, there is a distinction that should be borne in mind. There is a kind of belief that is wholly distinct from faith. The existence and power of God the truth of his word are facts that even Satan and his hosts cannot at heart deny. The Bible says that the devils also believe and tremble. James 2.9 But this is not faith. Where there, where there is only a brief... Sorry. Where there is only a belief in God's word, but a submission of the will to him, where the heart is yielded to him, the affections fixed upon him, there is faith. Faith that works by love and purifies the soul. Through faith, this faith, the heart is renewed in the image of God. So believing is not enough. Believing is not enough. But having a, a relationship, that ingredient of love needs to be there. It's already there on, on his end. We need help to get it on our end. Let's, uh, let's turn to 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. And we're going to ask the question, what is love, coming up pretty soon. But before that, let's look at a couple of these verses. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1. There we go. It says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed on us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Now I'm going to make a connection here with another verse from John, the, the Gospel of John, chapter 1 and verse 12. John chapter 1 and verse 12. John chapter 1 and verse 12. It says, but as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So God, through love, love is the power, in other words. God, through love, has given the sons of men the power to become the sons of God. Which means what for us? What does it mean to become the sons of God, or daughters of God. To be in a covenantal relationship with him. 
right? I'll give you an example. Uh, we're not going to turn there, but it's something you're all familiar with. To the church of Ephesus in Revelation, the letter, what was their problem? They lost something. They lost their first love. They lost their first love. What does that mean? They lost their sight on Christ, didn't they? See, it doesn't even matter at that point whether they were doing evangelism or not. They could have been. Certainly they were. Uh, because that's one of the churches that has very few bad things to say about it. But they lost, they broke their focus on Jesus Christ. How do you break your focus on Jesus Christ? You can read the Bible as much as you want. You can do all sorts of things. You can have, you can have all sorts of ritualistic, uh, ceremonial type of things that you do in connection with God. But what is the difference with this type of love? It's a relationship. It's the heart. Right. Bill? You know, Cody, in Acts of the Apostles, I don't have the page, but I could get it. Uh, Ellen White says that when the church, the apostolic church, left their first love, they turned away from the foundational truths that God had given through Judaism, you know, through the sanctuary and through the prophets and, and everything, and they started creating new ideas. Exactly. And Cody, that's exactly what's going on amongst us today with all of these false teachings. It's because people have left their first love of Christ and submission to him and want to create something new. Yes, because they have to replace it. Exactly. When, they lose, when you lose your relationship with Christ, but you still want to follow the Christian teachings, in other words, you're try, still trying salvation. It becomes a work salvation at that point, by the way. But once you break focus on Jesus Christ, that's when all these other doctrines are going to come in. You see, we see these things. We see these things happen around us. These things are symptoms to the problem. They're not the problem itself. The problem itself is that the focus has gone from Christ and now it's on self. I'm going to perfect myself or whatever. I'm going to work for this. I'm going to do this. Oh, look at this new teaching. Look at that new teaching. Something to arouse the feelings, to give you that, that counterfeit feeling that you used to have when you used to walk in Christ. So it's, it's that simple. It's the relationship with Jesus Christ that's so important. Paul? Yeah, and it's interesting, you know, while everybody looks at Steps to Christ as, oh, this wonderful book, you know, it's poison to Baptists. They absolutely loathe that book because it totally undermines their theology, their doctrine, because the Bible to a Baptist is not literal. And this love is what Jesus said, greater love hath no man for another than he lay down his life. So along with that first love for another lay down his life for another. Along with that first love also goes the concern for saving souls according to the way Christ did it. Yes. So it's not just a mushy, gooey, I love Jesus. I had a lady call me this week, uh, I guess, I don't know, from 12, 14 years ago, she got one of our books. She wanted to come and I told her, and I guess she was a Benny Hinn disciple. Mm. And okay. we were talking about the Holy Spirit. Well, you have to have proof of the Holy Spirit and so on. And I said, when she said, uh, what do you believe about that? I said, if you speak not according to the law and the testimony, there's no light in him. The Holy Spirit will always bring you back to Christ. And if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So she didn't want to come after that. She was talking about the other kind of love. You, you know what I'm talking yes. about. Now, I'll let you get on with your sermon. Yes, absolutely. That's what we see. Is that not what we see? Do we have an intelligent love for Christ today in the world? Typically, no, we don't. When you go to, uh, not that any of you would, but when you see maybe on some video or something of these non-denominational Christian churches, and I'm not picking on them or anything, but you have people come in and, you know, they start their rock concert. And then what happens? They go like that. And they lift their, they, they close their eyes. And what are they trying to do? 
They're trying to gain that counterfeit love again, aren't they? What is it? What is it? Is it intelligence based or feeling based? Feeling. You see, one of the most amazing truths in the Bible to me is that the Bible proves that love is a choice and not a feeling. You choose. Anyone who's been married for any number of years knows you choose to love the other person. Madeline? That's, that's the point I wanted to make because um, Spirit of Prophecy tells us that love is not, the love that we ought to have for, for God is not an emotional type of love. It's a love that's based on principle and that principle is based on um, the, um, the willingness to be obedient right. to his law. And that's the same type of um, love that we're supposed to reflect to our spouses because marital love is not supposed to be an emotional type of love. Exactly. And it can be both at times, which is amazing. But first and foremost, our principles must be the foundation of the decisions that we make, not the feelings. That's why our divorces are so high in, uh, in Western civilization. Because in Western civilization, more so in Eastern civilization, though it's there too and it's climbing fast, everything is about feeling what you feel. I don't love this person anymore or I don't, right? But in Eastern civilization, there's still a big understanding that it is duty. Marriage is duty. Therefore, it's a choice. You see, there's a difference. Um, I'm, not, I'm not espousing uh, necessarily Eastern thought. I'm just saying uh, that's sort of where we headed. Let's go to 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8. We get some interesting information here about love. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8 states this, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. God is love. God is love. He's the creator of it, <laughs> if you will. He is the embodiment of it. His commandments are the transcript of his character. It shows that he will never steal from you. He will never kill you. He will never commit adultery against you. See, it's a covenant relationship that is also reflected in him. You see, he does, he's not going to have any other idols either. We are his people. We are his creation. We are his covenant people. He's not going to commit adultery against us. So that your, the character of God is right there personified in the commandments. And the Bible says that he that loveth not, do you think they're talking about the intelligent love or the feeling-based love? when they say, he that loveth not knoweth not God. No. The deep, eternal, unconditional love of God. So let's turn to one of the greatest chapters in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And I'm going to read verses 1 through 8. And then 13. The Apostle Paul states this. What's that? 1 Corinthians chapter 13, starting in verse 1. 1 through 8, and then verse 13. Gives us a little bit more information about love, and therefore about God. The Apostle Paul states this. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity... That word charity is the word agape. It means brotherly love. It means unconditional, selfless love. It's not a feeling-based love. It's not an obsession with someone or something type of love or an addiction. It's a true, selfless love. So, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not love, I am nothing. Did you hear that? We could have all the doctrine in the world. 
We could have every single thing perfect, bullseye correct. But if we don't have love, Apostle Paul says it's worthless and we're nothing. Amazing. Going on with the verse. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profits me nothing. Wow. This, is a, this, this verse right here tells you about the motives. God judges the motives of people very well. If we're not doing things based on love, then what are we doing it based on? Some type of selfish reason, right? Do we get, do we get brownie points for, for giving our house to the poor if we're doing it to save ourselves? Saying, God, look what I did. You have to save me. We don't get anything for that, do we? But if we do the same exact act, and people wouldn't even notice because it's something that's done in the heart. That's why it says God reads the hearts. If the same person did the same exact act, but they did it out of love for God because they wanted to, to promote the three angels' messages, then it would count towards their account, wouldn't it? Because the motive, the motive is pure. Paul? You know, Cody, that's interesting, of course, that you're bringing this up because this is a big issue in, in Christendom. And I was just Absolutely. talking about chapter 73 of Desire of Ages, where it's uh, let not your heart be troubled, where Mrs. White makes a very interesting statement. You know, you've read these books, but you forget them. And you go back through and you find these things. She said that, and going along with what you're saying about where this love and understanding comes from, she said educators, theologians, teachers, PhDs, cannot teach the gospel. They may have theories and ideas. Schools cannot teach only the Holy Spirit, which comes from Jesus Christ. And your opening statement, give you power to become sons and daughters of God. Well, there's that statement. So all these educators, all these schools are incapable of teaching this. Only the Holy Spirit can. She makes that statement. Yeah, because are you going to get that power from a man? Right, no. and she calls him the third person of the Godhead right there. And that's good enough for me. Yep. Third person of the Godhead? That's another subject. I'm not going to go there right now. But in verse 4, continuing in verse 4, that agape love, love suffereth long and is kind. God suffereth long and is kind. God envieth not. God vaunteth not himself. He is not puffed up. He does not behave himself unseemly. He seeks not his own. He's not easily provoked. He thinks no evil. He rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love is truth, folks. He bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. God never fails. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. And picking up in verse 13, And now abideth faith, hope, and love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Isn't that amazing? Isn't it amazing? It, it, it almost brings a tear to my eye standing up here in front of you to think that God hopes in me. That he believes in me. That he, he's saying, I know you can do this. Don't give up. Don't quit. That's the God we serve. So God is love. What else is love? Love is keeping the commandments. Because God is love. The commandments are a representation of his character. Therefore, keeping the commandments is love. I'll prove that to you right now. Let's turn to uh, Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. And verse 8 and 9. Amazing here. How you can say the law has been done away with after reading this verse, I don't know. The Apostle Paul states, Owe no man anything but to love one another. 
For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. You hear that? Love is the fulfillment of the law. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in the saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. And he identifies which law that is in there, doesn't he? So, love is the fulfillment of the commandments. If we have the love, if we love God, in other words, it doesn't matter what people say. People say a lot of things. It doesn't matter if I stand up in front of you and, and stand on my head and dance and say that I love God. If I'm not keeping his commandments, my actions prove that I don't. And there's individuals that, are, that don't know all the commandments, that don't know the bindingness of the commandments, um, and God judges those uh, according to their heart. But if you know the commandments and you're not keeping them, is that faith that works by love and purifies the soul unto salvation? No. Hilda? Also, if you break the commandments in half, the first four are about loving God and the rest are about loving others. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Samuel's got something to add. This is why Sister White, I forgot what book it is, says that the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians should be read every single day. I think it was one of the manuscripts, but she probably, it's probably Review and Herald. Every it should be memorized, she says. Every day. Because it's a reflection of what true love is. Did you see in those that love is a feeling? Love is, love is butterflies in your stomach. Love is that, that shiny, uh, you know, beautiful sun in the morning. Where, did it say anything about that? It said, love envieth not. It puffeth. It doesn't rejoice in iniquity. It re it's an intelligent love. It's an intelligent. It's logical. Um, so love is the obedience, keeping the commandments. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 20. God says point blank that it is. Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 20. A very interesting verse. That thou mayest love the Lord thy God, and that thou mayest obey his voice, and that thou mayest cleave unto him, for he is thy life and the strength of thy days, that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord sware unto thy fathers to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob to give to them. That's what the Lord wants. He wants us to be obedient to his commandments. Not because he's a, a tyrannical king, but because if we don't keep the commandments, we hurt ourselves, and then we will hurt others. And God's not going to have someone in his kingdom that is both hurting themselves and others. That's, that, that defies the the whole logic of a government that is designed to protect its citizens, right? Will the citizens be protective if they're in danger of sinners committing some atrocity against them? No. So God says, cleave to me. He wants, what a, where do, where's the, the first time we see the word cleave? What? Marriage. Adam said, a man shall leave his mother and father and what to his wife? Cleave. That's what we're to do. That's what God wants us to do with him. He wants us to cleave to him. It's a relationship. Let me, um, no, you know what? We'll, we'll read Deuteronomy. Let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 12 and 13. And then we'll read a, a section from Steps to Christ. Deuteronomy chapter 10. In verses 12 to 13. And now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee? In other words, what does he want from you? But to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God with 
all thy heart and with all thy soul to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes which I command you this day for thy good. It's for our good. That's trust. That's love. When we keep God's commandments, it proves we're in a relationship with him. And when we keep God's commandments, we don't keep them because we're supposed to in order to gain salvation. That's not how we keep them. Otherwise, we'll fail. We keep them because we love God. We keep them because we know that we trust him, that these commandments are commandments for a reason, and that our way is not better than his, and we don't know more than he does, and that when I see that commandment that says for me not to do this, then that's the Lord's will. And I love him so much that I'll do what he wants. It's a relationship. I have a very powerful quote, again, from Steps to Christ, page 69, or sorry, 91. On the chapter on the privilege, the privilege of prayer. Through nature and revelation... Through his providence and by the influence of his spirit, God speaks to us. But these are not enough. We need also to pour out our hearts to him. In order to have spiritual life, listen to this, in order to have spiritual life and energy, we must have actual intercourse with our heavenly father. Our minds may be drawn out towards him. We may meditate upon his works, his mercies, his blessings, but this is not, in the fullest sense, communing with him. In order to commune with God, we must have something to say to him concerning our actual life. That's faith that works by love and purifies the soul. I know that this probably has happened to a lot of us, if not all of us, Sometimes you fall into this sort of dredge of, okay, I wake up in the morning, I have this ritualistic sort of repetitive prayer that I pray, and then I get along with my business, and I try my best to keep the commandments. It's not what God wants. He doesn't want that. He wants you. He wants us. He wants us to talk to him to share our fears with him, to share our, our trials, our tribulations. Mrs. White says in that same book that there's not a single tear he doesn't notice, that there's not a single smile that he doesn't mark. He loves and cares for us so much that as Paul brought out, there's no greater love than what Jesus Christ did for us. But he wants a relationship with us. He wants to get to know us. Not to just have us enter into a covenant agreement contract with him and keep his commandments, but to actually pour out our hearts to him on a daily basis. Folks, that is how we'll gain spiritual energy. That's how we'll gain spiritual life. That's how the loud cry will be will form up into that loud cry that it is, and that will turn this world upside down. It's when we are in close relationship with God. 